Good morning, everyone, and <clears throat> thank you so much for coming to uh, hear about Point of Discovery School, a new school that will be starting in Stevens Point next year in the fall. My name is Jen Zock. I am a former school board member, and now I am the governance board president of Point of Discovery School. I am standing with Mia Schmiel. Good morning. Mia, <laughs> Mia is a school designer with Expeditionary Learning. Expeditionary learning is the model of um, education that Point of Discovery School will be using. So just a brief history for you. About three, three and a half years ago, a group of people, primarily staff in the Stevens Point School District, um, looked at our educational model and our student needs and decided that in our middle school area especially, we needed to provide something for students that was different than the traditional model. So we looked at lots of different models, and expeditionary learning was the one that seemed to fit the needs of our students the best. So we started on this path of seeing if we could apply for a grant to start a new charter school, and we got it. We got the grant. Um, and after working with the school board for quite a while and answering questions, we decided that we needed one more planning year because I think when you're starting a new school, there's really never enough time to plan. Um, so the school board allowed us to uh, apply for a second grant for a second year to try once again to get this school up and running. And this fall on November 11th, the school board granted us a five-year contract to start next year with 56th and 7th graders, um, and then adding 50 students the second year and 50 students the third year, so that we're up in, in that third year, we'll be up to 150 students in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. So Mia and I are going to tell you a little bit about expeditionary learning, and we're actually going to show it to you in the best way that I learned when I first started to learn about what this expeditionary learning thing was all about. And that's by showing you a video that um, uh, National Public Television, the PBS NewsHour produced, that went through an expedition in King Middle School in Maine. And it starts at the beginning of the expedition, and it goes to the end of the expedition, so that you really get a feel for what's different about this school and why it operates differently than a traditional school and you as educators will understand why the need for this type of model is so great with some of the students in our school district and why this is such an important opportunity for not only the school district but for the students and parents to have this as a choice for their students um, as they move forward into middle school. Next, how one public school in New England is taking a different approach to teaching, immersing students in an unusually comprehensive science curriculum that emphasizes problem solving. Special correspondent John Talenko of Learning Matters, which produces education stories for the NewsHour, has our story. On a crisp fall morning last October, King Middle School in Portland, Maine, invited eighth graders to what it calls a kickoff, the unveiling of an in-depth project that would be at the center of nearly all the students' courses for the next four months. So I direct your attention to this slide. This is called Earth at Night. Science and teacher Peter Hill image. set the stage. There are certain parts of the world that use a ton of energy. Along with that, 25% of the world's population doesn't have electricity in their home. But enough solar energy hits the Earth every hour to supply the entire world's energy needs for a year. So we need to design tools that can capture all that sunlight that's hitting our Earth or capture all that wind power that's sitting out in the Gulf of Maine. We need to, wait for it, revolt. Hill handed the students an ambitious assignment to fulfill by the end of the project. You're going to create a device that captures natural energy and transforms it into something that's useful for people in some part of the world. I was like, I can't do that. Taking all this in was Leva Pierce. That's, that's way too much. I, was, I don't know the first thing about electricity. I don't know the first thing about William Mills. I am totally going to fail. I was like, there's no way that's going to happen. Emma Schwartz. 
first of all, I can't build anything, and I've never handled a screwdriver in my entire life, or an electric drill, like this isn't gonna work. So I want you to think about the big picture here. Projects that take students into uncharted territory are at the heart of teaching and learning at King. Though it's a regular public school, this approach, called expeditionary learning, is unusual, but could be just the kind of education students need in a rapidly changing world. This expedition began with a design challenge. We're building robots that are made to collect resources, which are ping pong balls. Nat Youngren and his classmates were building their robots from kits that allow for an almost infinite number of possibilities. You can do whatever you want to make them do this, but they have to be able to go out, get ping pong balls, and bring them back. I made mine completely sound controlled, so you can control it to turn and move back to your base. This one has to be much longer. Working in teams, students spent four weeks perfecting their robots in a class called Tech Ed. Gus Goodwin is the teacher. This kind of really hones in on engineering. What is the design process? I'll take care of the programming for that. They have to program a robot, build it, tinker with it, and get it to work. Leva Pierce, who at the kickoff had feared failing, seemed to embrace robotics. We made this um, wide thing that when it goes forward, it will catch the balls. It's pretty hard. Oh, two, two. We got Just before Thanksgiving, students put their creations to the test at a school competition dubbed Robo Wars. Get set, go. Nat Youngren's robot started well enough and stalled. The room was too noisy for its sound controls. Oh my God. As for Leva Pierce, her team finished second. The objective for all the students was that this activity would somehow bring them closer to designing an energy-generating device of their own. The robot competition was really successful. Kids are really, I think they've internalized the design process. They know it's an ongoing process. They know they need to engineer their designs and constantly revise and get feedback. And so we're on our way. By early December, Students were on to the second leg of their journey, learning the science and social issues that would be at the heart of their invention. And the path teachers chose to take students there, an eight-week-long interdisciplinary study of wind power. Science teacher Peter Hill. We started with a wind turbine. How do these things create electricity? And we took apart a motor. And we said, well, there's magnets and wires in here. How do magnets and wires interact to generate electricity? To make the learning go deeper, in tech ed class, students built working model wind turbines. The criteria for this project is the wind turbine that is stable and sturdy. It has to generate at least one volt of, of electricity. And the other piece is we want it to be creative, outrageous, ingenious, and inspirational. The politics of wind power was the subject in social studies. Emma Schwartz. The point is to find a place where it would be good or possible to have a wind turbine, see what the environmental impacts might be if there's a bunch of huge like turbines in the area. You get those discussions around what is the sense of place and what is scenic beauty and, and how do you um, alleviate um, that, that issue. Let's see where you are. Next, Mark Jervis's students will argue for their turbine in a persuasive essay addressed to local officials. But for their life-improving invention, students would need to know about faraway places. In English class, they read The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, the autobiography of William Kampwamba of Malawi, Africa. He managed to build a big wind turbine, power his house, and he did it all with, like, you know, a book and some trash. They went through this awful famine, and that was really shocking to me that he can go through that and still have hope. That was, I think that was a really big theme in the book. Like, if you really just try and you don't really stop, no matter what kind of what's in your way, you just, you'll eventually get there. Inspired by the book, students like Leva Pierce pushed ahead with their own model wind turbines. 
I had a lot of struggles with my turbine. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna make this generate more than a volt. So I made a whole new set of blades. That worked a lot better. But then I heard about other people that were getting like, oh, I heard he got six volts. And I was like, oh, gotta get more than that. After eight weeks and three new sets of blades, Leva and her classmates wind turbines were finally ready. And King Middle School staged another competition. The more I got into it, the more I just couldn't stop. I was steadily increasing, which is really, really good. Each turbine's electrical output was captured by a computer. Leva's topped out at 5.9 volts. In the team competition. And when the final tallies were announced. Give it up for the winners, lobsters. Her team finished first. By February, students had reached the final stage of the project, creating an energy-generating device that improves people's lives. As a team of teachers, we brainstormed, you know, what are 10 things that really need to get solved in the world? We came up with purify water, light a room at night, um, charge a cell phone, stuff like that, just to kind of get kids rolling, just give them a little push to get the creative juices flowing. The assignment was to create a technical drawing. Emma Schwartz designed a light. I call it the rub-a-dub scrub. It's a sponge that generates light, which you might think, oh my god, everyone's gonna get electrocuted, but no, I'm gonna make sure no one gets electrocuted. As you can see, there's like a little dome with lights at the top. There's scrubbers on the bottom. The scrubbers are attached to magnets, which spin around wires. When you rotate it on dishes, um, the scrubbers rotate. That creates the electrons to flow, and that um, generates electricity. Leva Pierce created a crank flashlight. It will have um, UVB, UVC, and a regular light. UVC kills bacteria in water. Her UVB light is supposed to draw insects away from people. And it will have off regular water bugs, and I'm calling it the EcoBright. <laughs> For the final event of the project, parents were invited in to hear all about the students' inventions. The rub-a-dub scrub takes the usually wasted rotational kinetic energy of... This is like live. You're showing what you're learning to other people, which kind of gives you something more back, I think. And you have to be clear and concise. Giving presentations is so important because it really arms you with skills that you'll need later in life. Just think if washing dishes could be fun. Like Emma's invention, the students' creations will go no further than the drawing board. What's more, as they move on to new subjects and new grades, they may forget the particulars of amps and electrons. But some things they will remember. Through this expedition, I have learned how to communicate with other people to make something happen. And I think that's what changed me most. Before this expedition, I kind of always thought of myself as... I'm good at writing, and I'm good at reading, and that's what I'm good at. This expedition has completely changed my um, idea of science. Yeah. Science is doing, and science is building, and science is creating. What makes this school a success? It's not because of any charter status. It's a regular public school. It's not because it caters to some students over others. It's diverse, with open admission. The secret, as we saw it, was relevance. Usually in school, you learn about things that are happening in the world that are bad. In social studies, you might learn about an earthquake. But I feel that schools shouldn't just be about learning about problems. I think they should be about solving them. Because if you aren't learning about how to solve problems, then what will you do when you're out of school? The expeditionary learning approach is growing and can be found in 161 public schools nationwide. Well, there's one for all of you who write in asking for positive stories in our world. And tomorrow, we'll have another look at new ways to engage students in science and promote... We're not highlighted um, within the, the movie were crew. Um, and in an expeditionary learning school, 
crew is a foundational piece of building community within the school itself. So in a crew, there are anywhere from 10 to 15 students per adult. And when I say adult, that's anybody from the principal, the dean of students, the guidance counselor, all the way to custodial staff. Um, everyone within the school is part of the community. And during crew, students and staff talk about things like habits of scholarship, um, perseverance, like what you saw modeled in the video here. Um, students look at their academic progress. We talk about literacy. But crew is a place where kids feel part of an even smaller family. And it's a really important piece of creating the sense of belonging in the school. Um, and it wasn't highlighted in the movie, but is, is really key to being successful and is a cornerstone of an EL school. We also look at um, expeditions. So the video basically took you through an expedition from beginning to end. When we build our expeditions or our studies at uh, Point of Discovery, we will look at issues and experts and the access that we have to real, live, authentic data collection that lives here in the Stevens Point community. And that's one of the things that's really different about an EL model, where it's not like you bring in something and everybody's teaching at the same page at the same time. Um, we build it off of what's intriguing to the students. And also, what are the needs of the community? So as we build the Point of Discovery School, we're really looking at what do we have here in the Stevens Point area that kids can study and kind of get dirty in and um, do real, real authentic research. And that gets us into community involvement. You saw um, within the video that kids were analyzing data and they were um, looking at ways to improve life outside of their school. Over the course of that expedition and the expeditions that will build at Point of Discovery, experts, real engineers, um, will come in and work with our students to critique their models, um, to give feedback on artistic projects that we might have. Um, to look at writing that students may be doing. So when, when we look at a typical day for a point of discovery student, um, it's looking at crew, how do we build our sense of community in our school. It's looking at those rigorous expeditions that are based here in the Stevens Point community. And then really how do we bring community into the school and even more importantly get our kids out and doing real work in our um, Stevens Point area. So by looking at the movie and just getting kind of a sense of how we'll build point of discovery here around our experts and around our kiddos, I hope gives you an idea as to what the EL model is like. And Jen has a, a couple other um, ideas about giving you more information as well. So because we're part of the Stevens Point School District, we really wanted you, who are part of the Stevens Point School District, to know what was happening with um, Point of Discovery School. Students choose us, so we're in the process right now of really getting the word out in the community that this is an opportunity that middle school students have to choose this different model of education. Um, there's an application that's both on the uh, front uh, page of the Stevens Point School District's web page under District News. And then we also have our own web page, pointofdiscoveryschool.com, which would be a great way for you to learn more should you be interested in uh, learning more if we've piqued your interest this morning. Um, and that's what our website looks like. So there's lots of neat upcoming events. Um, when, you, when you're at our website and you click on that tab, You'll notice that we have informational meetings coming up. Um, just yesterday, we offered a slice day. A slice is a longitudinal look at an expedition from beginning to end from 8.30 in the morning until 3.30 in the afternoon. We had 33 parents and students yesterday come to learn about Expeditionary Learning School. We had offered a slice day back in October uh, where we had community members and school board members come so that they could be exposed to the expeditionary learning model. And we'll offer another slice day on February 28th and probably one in March as well because what we're finding is that um, we're maxing out on the enrollment for the days. So we need to continue to offer them so that um, students and their parents can come and learn about what we're all about. Um, we also have two informational meetings coming up, one on February 3rd, one on March 3rd. 
They're both on a Tuesday, 7 p.m. in the Portage County Public Library. Um, we've offered a couple of informational sessions already, and they've been um, just really great ways for people to come, community members to come and learn about the school. So we encourage you to learn more. We really thank you this morning for listening to um, our information that we had to impart. We really wanted you as um, staff in the Stevens Point School District to know what's going on. So um, talk to your students about it, learn about it, and uh, share this great news because it's a really wonderful opportunity that we have in the school district. So thank you so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Good job. Thank you. At this time, if you're a K through 8 teacher, you'll want to stay here for the Badger 3-8. If you're a ninth grade teacher, but you do some 7th and 8th, you just need to decide if you want to stay here for the Badger 3-8 or come upstairs to the ACT session with the 10 through 12. So ninth grade teachers, you have an option. If you're purely ninth grade, you probably want to come upstairs for the ACT. For the high school section, K-8, stay here. We'll start in just a few minutes. Thank you very much.